Uh, so, Jyoti, I want to be able to have a conversation a little bit about your journey with mm -hmm. AppDynamics. Sure. Uh, but also love to hear about what you have going on today since okay. you have a, your hands in a few things. Um, but um, just maybe for the audience, that those of you, uh, those out there that don't know what AppDynamics did, sure. give just a 30 second high, bit on that. High level, AppDynamics was about monitoring and analyzing software applications. We all have a lot of software and so things go wrong in software and AppDynamics was about helping with that. So bring us back to the time when you first started AppDynamics. Okay, uh, sure. so what gave you that inspiration, that courage to leave your job at Wiley and, and start this company? Sure. So um, I was working at this startup called Wiley, which was in the first generation of application monitoring kind of solutions. So I know the space, I knew the domain, and that company was acquired by CA, Computer Associates, which is you know, very, which is not a company known for innovation of any kind. So it's, uh, <laughs> it was very clear, and you know, the, the world, it's like you could see I was working there as an engineer, but I could see like you know how cloud computing is coming and how microservices are coming and how it's more and more software being built. And this was before the software is eating the world phrase was coined. So, but it was clear that software will eat the world, right? So, I was uh, you know I was like we need to build if if software is going to eat the world, someone has to make sure things work in software, right? If things don't work, it's it's a problem. So, I was uh, let me you know as a founder you start you start getting this fire inside you as in like, you know, someone needs to solve this problem. And you just start getting more and more convinced that someone needs to solve this problem. And at some point you are like, you know, if, okay, if, why not me? Like if, if no one else is going to solve it, why don't I try to solve it? And that's really how it started. You know, it's like, I, you know, I started pitching, I started writing some code uh, for it. And I started pitching to some VCs and uh, uh, to try to get capital raised. Got a lot of rejections initially. And uh, then one day one VC told me, it's like, you know, do you really believe in, what you're talking about. And I said, yeah, I do. So it's like, why are you still in your job? And so that was a good question. So I, next day I quit my job and started doing it. And then in a few months, the company got started and you know, venture capital happened. So. Talk a little bit about, now you started it as a sole founder. Uh -huh. You had no co-founders with you, which is not that common. W what gave you the courage to do that? Uh, it's not that I set out to do it as a sole founder. Actually, I, I tried to look for co-founders. What happened was things started moving fast. And you know, I was not ready to, let's say, jump into a co-founding relationship with someone very fast. So it, it's not, you know, so my, my advice to anyone is it's, it's not like, you know, one way or the other. I would, I would love to have a co-founder every time. So when I'm doing my new company, Harness, the first thing I did was let me find a co-founder because it's not easy to do as a sole founder. So I don't, I, don't, I did that. I built the company as a sole founder, but I, I prefer not to. Got it. Now, let's now get, walk through the journey of um, when AppDynamics got started, and then all the way to the first customer. Talk about a little bit about that journey. Sure. You know, that's that's kind of the first step for every startup, right? The product market fit phase, finding your first few customers, and we, it, you know, it took us about twenty months, so maybe slightly longer than than a, than a lot of uh, companies. But it's uh, and we had to do a few pivots because I had some assumptions about about how we were building app dynamics. Like initially it was, the first assumption I had was, in a couple of years everything will be in the cloud, in a public cloud. And I realized like it's not gonna take two years, it's gonna take 10 years. So it's, uh, but this was 2008 and I was like, so we were building it all for, let's just build assuming everything is going to be in Amazon. And it was a wrong <coughs> assumption, right? So we had to redo it. So things well, like right that. Right assumption, just 10 years later. 10 years, right assumption, but 10 years later, right? So you, but you have to have the right kind of flexibility and humility and the, uh, ability to adjust, you know, because that my, my whole investor deck was about everything is going to move in, in AWS and people need to manage those apps. And I was, you know, so I, I, but I had to completely rethink that because it wasn't moving, you know, in two years. So things like that. So it took us 20 months to find the right kind of adjustment, like where the real pain is and how can we help people now and how can we build a product that there will be a lot of demand. And that's, it's, you know, it's a lot of people talk about the science of product market, but there's really no science there. It's just, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's kind of an art. And, and a lot of it, it goes to how many customers you can talk to. Can you have the right conversations? Can you understand what customers are doing? Uh, really understand their pain. Really understand what their business, you know, uh, what their business need would be. And it, it, it took us some time. And once we had that, the, the core, core uh, for us was like cold calling, really. You know, it's like, you know, as I, I, was, I started company as an engineer and I didn't have any experience in selling or anything, right? 
but I became a very master cold caller. And that's what the core part of like, you know, because I will call these, all these customers and try to get meetings and pitch what we're doing and get feedback and we did like hundreds of them. And by doing hundreds of them, we were very clear like, you know, what do we need to really build? So by the time they had our first few customers, actually they came from those cold calling that we were doing. And you know, they, but we also had a product that was pretty applicable to a lot of people. We'll talk a little bit about product market because that's a very interesting question. But so you as an engineer, where did you learn how to do the cold call and how to be able to hear <laughs> that from customers? Because apparently you were able to land some deals by yourself. Yeah, you know, yeah, it, it's, 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 a, it's a bit ironic. Like I started as an engineer, as a programmer, and, and for, for the first few years I was coding pretty actively for AppDynamics products. But I, now I can probably write a book on sales more than engineering. So as a, as, a, as a startup CEO, sales is your number one job, you know, that, and it always is. So you learn, you have to learn, there is no other option. You have to learn sales, and you have to, in some ways, become good at it. If you don't, it doesn't work, right? So the, the main thing, in, you know, in the previous session, you know, uh, the discussion on the sales is a skill, and a lot of times people don't realize that there's a skill to it. You know, and this, a lot of the skill comes down to the, the numbers game around it. Like, you know, how do you, you know, what, what message you would do, you know, how would you manage the numbers game, how many people you have to reach out to get how many calls, you know, how do you convert them into thing, meetings, things like that, right? Yeah, well, you, you certainly learned where others didn't. <laughs> So um, well, let's talk about the product market because that seems like that is an area that has a lot of uh, different definitions around it. It's mm -hmm. a milestone, very qualitative that yeah. quite frankly a lot of CEOs get right. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them get it wrong. But if you, and, and the, the problem behind that is if you don't have product market fit and you invest behind the company, mm -hmm. it, can be, um, yeah. it can be bad. Mm -hmm. What are the signals that gave, that you saw during AppDynamics time that said, product market fit is here, we're gonna invest behind the company. Yeah, I, to me the, the number ones, you know, it, it started with this, like, you know, initially we'll pitch the product or like what we were doing, and then we'll ask people like, what do you think, you like it? And no one says, or a lot, most people don't, are, they want to be nice because as, as founder you are very passionate about your product, you know, no one wants to say, tell, it, tell in your face like, you know, it's not good. So it's, it's, it's very misleading because a lot of founders, and I was doing that mistake in, in, very early on, like, you know, because I was, people will say, yeah, this is good. And I will call them, like, you know, I remember, like, you know, someone introduced me to a few large banks in New York, and this was, like, the company was just four months old. And I went there, and I had meetings with, and I came back, and we were high-fiving the team, like, you know, we had so many great meetings in New York with all these banks. And then I, I started sending them follow-up mails, and no one ever responded. And I was like, what, what just happened? Like, you know, I had really great meetings, and no one is responding back. And what I realize is like, you know, if you're not asking the hard question or you're not open to the hard feedback or people don't want to give you hard feedback because you are so passionate as a founder about what you're doing. So what, what so the, then I made an adjustment. We were like, okay, let's ask the question on, would you pay for this? And see maybe that would be better. That also didn't work out very well because people will start getting like, once you ask the question, your people start getting into a little bit of a defensive, like a shield, a like negotiation shield comes up, right? So of, uh, so the question, and then we, we, the third iteration of the question that really worked for us was yeah. uh, when we started asking, how would you make the business case to your boss to pay for it? And so now it's like, once we started hearing, like, you know, say these, we'll have multiple conversations and people will say, this is how I'll make the business case. Like we have this pain and this is how your product will help me with this pain. And the business case would be like, right now we are spending this much money in, you know, doing this. And if you, if you have a product like yours, we can save this much money. So once we started hearing that same again and again from multiple customers, like 10, 15, 20 customers, that's when we had the right product market fit. And my advice to normally people is like, you know, if, we, if you're, the people you're talking to, you're, and in, in a large number of customers can articulate the business case for you, that means you have the product market fit uh, for, for your product. And maybe just on that to double click into product as well, uh, some say that actually customers don't know what they want. Uh -huh. um, that you, if you listen to them too much, you may just be building a mediocre product. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that, disagree with that? Yeah, it, it, see that's where the balance is, like you know, you want to, you want to educate the customer first, and then ask feedback. If you ask with like, tell me what you want, that's when you build a mediocre product, right? So you have to start with like, you know, that you have to show them the possibility first. Like you know, this, like what you're, because a lot of customers, they don't even know like, a, a better way is possible. So if you ask them about, tell me what you want and we'll build a better way, they don't know the better way. It's your job to come up with a better way. Your job is to innovate as a company. So you have to show them, hey, this is the better way we are proposing. And after that, but you, you have to ask, 
is does it work for them? Would they pay for it? Would they, how would they make the business case? So it's, it's that balance, right? You know, if you, if you, if you said this is the better way we are proposing, but no one cares about the better way, that's a problem, right? So it's, it's, it's really, that's what you gotta balance. Now, you've spoken about this before, but thinking about going from product to the market, uh -huh. um, you know, you, there's large enterprises that you can mm -hmm. go after, there's also small, medium businesses that you can go after. Mm -hmm. Two very different go-to-market games. So, thinking about, you know, for the startups that are out here, which market they should go after, from your perspective, do you think uh, you choose the market, or does the market choose you? It's, it's a little bit of both, but you, you, at some point you have to make the call, what market, you know, either market chooses you or you choose the market, but you have to make the call, because it's very hard to do both large enterprise and SMB at the same time, for, for most companies. Uh, in our case, you know, it really came out to like, initially we didn't really, uh, you know, our expertise from a tech perspective was Java and .NET applications, initially. And those were in mostly in larger enterprises. In SMB, there were different kind of programming languages like Ruby and PHP and Python kind of languages. So that kind of determined our market very early on. But then we soon realized, okay, the bigger money is in the larger enterprise for us. So then we, by the time, so this, we, this happened in the product market fit kind of phase. Like, you know, I normally define things as like, you know, the zero to one million dollar is that figuring out product market fit, what is, what, do you even have a product, do you even have the, the, the you know, the need for your product there in the market. Mm -hmm. And that's when we kind of figured out like, you know, what we are building is really the more pain is in larger enterprise. And it was very clear, we'll see the numbers, like it's uh, that 80% of the market was large enterprise and 20% was SMB. And the hardest decision we have to do at some point was like, can we serve both the 80% of large enterprise and 20% of SMB or we have to pick one. And one of our competitors, uh, you know, New Relic, they were doing really well in the, in the 20% the SMB market, but their background was different sort of programming languages. So they, they, the market picked them also because they were st they started monitoring Ruby applications, just mostly small startups and businesses. Uh, so market was, but but they, since they were doing well there, we always would have that debate internally, like, you know, why are we not competing with them there? And at some point we made the determination, no, it's like, 80, you know, we would rather win the 80% of the market and leave the 20% alone uh, because we can't do both. And, you know, it's, if we can't do both and we have to pick one, I would rather go after 80% because it's also a better fit. But once you make the determination, now you have to start engineering everything around it. Your sales, your marketing, your customer success, your, you know, even your maybe even fundraising strategy, because it's, it's different, like how you go after the enterprise market, what, how, what would it cost versus what would it cost in SMB. Yeah, well, so just as follow up on that, it, I, you know, I think I understood that AppDynamics had a unique hybrid go to market mm -hmm. because you didn't neglect the SMBs, you didn't, uh, but it, while going after the enterprise. Uh, Talk a no, little bit that, about that. That's not necessarily true. What our hybrid go-to market was really about how we go into the enterprise, right? Okay. So, so there are, so if you look at the spectrum of go-to market models, right? So you have the, the very S, super SMB model, which is all about telesales and web-based demand generation completely. That's one extreme. And the, there's no concept of field sales. The, the, the second extreme is the very traditional enterprise sales, which is like, you know, you do multi-million dollar deals in enterprise and you, you have like these sales guys in suits selling in the, you know, in the, in, in the field. Our hybrid model was about how do we bring the best of two together and, and do and generate a sort of a, you know, lend and expand kind of model. So our model was like, you know, the, the front end of it was a freemium web-based marketing that you can download the product and use for free. Then we had like the land and expand, like you can do a small deal with us for 30K, 40K, 50K. And then we'll have field sales who will expand it to millions of dollars of deals eventually. But all of those was still designed for large enterprise. So it, it, the hybrid was not about SMB and enterprise combined. The hybrid was how do you go after enterprise in a higher velocity, which is not just the model of your very traditional enterprise sales, which is only field oriented. And it really depends on what product you are, you are building and what product you are selling. So that's, that's how we, we ended up. Ended so the focus was always on the enterprise. Yes. But you were able to do it in a unique way that didn't require just cold calling of expensive sales reps into large accounts. You had a way to be able to provide value earlier on. Yeah. Because also, you know, we, our product was a technical product, right? So you have to uh, involve developers, uh, you know, in, in there. So what the, the sales, you know, and I, I call it the, the sandwich strategy of selling. So what we did was like, you know, you go from the bottom and you go from the top at the same time. So we, we had the, the, our sales model was like, you know, you go to the, the, the bottom as in the end users, your engineers and developers who will use our products uh, from a freemium marketing strategy that we give them a free product to try and download. 
you know, a lot of times people will confuse like, okay, is that for SMB? And that wasn't for SMB. Like we, like say we, we sold to JP Morgan Chase, uh, you know, as our first large bank. It started with a developer downloading our product inside JPMC. So it's not that you do it premium only for SMB. You can do it for large enterprise, right? So, but that was going from the bottom. But at the same time, like you know, if you want to expand a company like that to like multi-million dollar account, you have to go from the top also. You also have to start getting air cover from senior execs. So, but if you do only do that, you're not gonna get ground adoption fast. So the best strategy that worked for us is like you gotta do both. Like you get like all these groups and smaller groups buying you and using you, and then you start going from the top to do air cover, and then you can expand into into a large footprint. Was that products. intentional since the beginning? You, you needed to go from the bottom. You needed to the, or was it, did it take a lot of iterations to get yeah, to the same nothing, You know, people can come here and say, yeah, it was all intentional. We knew what to do. No one knows what to do. Like, you just have, you figure out your way. Uh, but that's where we did iterate, and that's where we kind of landed up. Like, because we would, there was always a debate a bit internally, right? You know, there'll be people who are, hey, this freemium and good and uh, going from the bottom up is the right approach for developers, and which it, it is. But then we also had like really good enterprise salespeople who say like, we can't do a half a million dollar deal if we don't go to the C level exec. Right. And to me as a CEO, it was very clear like why don't we combine the two? Like you know it will be great if we can do because there is an advantage in both. You know I, I, it's very, it's a good point that you can't do a half a million dollar million dollar deal unless you go and talk to very senior people. And there's also a value that like you know for developer kind of products if you don't go directly to the engineers and don't convince them that's a problem because. These days, no C-level exec can go and tell their developers buy this product, because they, the, they have to go and be convinced themselves, uh, and they have to use it, try it, convince themselves. So you really, if you do both, you you get you you solve it properly. Right? Got it. You know, uh, let's talk a little bit about hyper growth to exit. So uh -huh. tw 2013 to 2016, how fast did you guys grow in terms of revenue? Uh, so, you know, 2013 to 2016, we grew from about 20. Five million to 150. Yeah, that's uh, so about 130, 130 or so, yes. Uh, and yeah, we grew pretty fast. How, how did that look like in terms of employees? We grew from about 200 employees to maybe about 1,200. Wow. Two or three, 250 employees to 1,200 or so. That's, uh, that's definitely hyper growth. Uh -huh. Talk a little bit about your role, because you, know, you, uh -huh. you started it as just the idea, uh -huh. all the way to be able to go to a full exit, or actually just growing the business to even uh -huh. 100 plus million in revenue. Uh -huh. How did your role shift over time? Uh, the role changes, like, you know, I started as, a, as an engineer turned founder, uh, right? So in the first year, or first couple of years, it's really, you know, the z what I call the zero to one million phase. Your role is very, very product oriented. It's really all about finding the product market fit, you know, getting engineering right, getting product right, and, you know, it, 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 it's especially for a product like ours, which was pretty technical. So that's, that was the role. And then you kind of start getting there, like, you know, that I call it like the, the one to, to like say, you know, seven, eight million dollar kind of journey, right? That's when you you ha you know you have the early product market fit, but you have to learn how to sell. What is the pricing? What is the sales strategy? This enterprise sales, SMB sales, you know, uh, uh, freemium versus telesales versus field sales, and a lot of that happened in that that period. Like you know, a lot of iterations happened in that period. So so, you, so my job at that time was learning all different kind of sales motions. So like I and I studied every every sales motion possible in, you know, in different kind of companies so that we could figure out what the right model is. And that's where we came up with the right models were and we experimented, iterated. And you know, I look at us as CEO, my job was to focus on what's most critical. In the first couple of years, it was all about product market fit. In the, in, uh, the few years after that, the, the one million to that seven, eight million, it was all about finding the sales motion, go to market model, pricing, packaging, how do we sell, all that. And that's where I put a lot of my focus as a CEO was. After that, once you hit that number, it's really about scaling at that point. Like you, you kind of know, you know your product market fit, you know your go-to market model, now you just have to execute. Like you're not building and engineering and iterating, you're st still doing a little bit, but not every day, or not like that, not at a very rapid pace, right? So if you, if all you want to do is like at that point you want to, okay, I know how to scale this in number of units, right? So one unit produces this, can I put 10 units there? You know, 10 units produce this, can I put 100 units there, right? And you start engineering that really, right? And a lot of it is about, the, the role of CEO at that point is about managing that scale, managing people, you know, how do people come in and culture, you know, uh, hiring se senior execs, you know, uh, people who have experience with scaling, uh, so, and you manage them, lead them, so that's where the job of the CEO changes. 
Then you, you know, for us, at about maybe 60, 70 million dollars, like that was from like that seven, eight million dollars to 60, 70 million dollars, just all about just press the gas and go and scale. And, the, and we figured that out and like, you know, we had the right set of people and really senior execs and people who could do that. <coughs> then we started hitting this another inflection point of like, you know, that if we need to continue our growth, we need to become, we, go, we have to go from one product company to a platform yeah. of multiple products. So in some way, my job as CEO, or my focus as CEO became more about that. Okay, how do I go from that? Uh, because I, like, you know, if I have to make this like a 300, 500 million dollar revenue company, you have to start building that multiple product strategy, right? So then job as CEO become a, a becomes a little bit more strategic again. You know, it's it, a, instead of the tactical scaling and execution, it becomes like, how do you navigate the, 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 the markets and the future and the, the where the market would go, how, what products you build, and that's where, you know, so that's, that's happened. I, I, uh, when I stepped down from my CEO role, we were about 150 in million in revenue then. So that, but that was the last couple of years were more, a lot more about. And we, when we, you know, right before we were going IPO, we had about, uh, you know, we expanded from one product to a platform or suite of six products, and that allowed us to grow, continue to grow pretty fast. Right? Great. And then, uh, you know, I do want to be able to talk a little bit about your uh, uh, what you have next here. But it was January mm -hmm. last year yes. that the transaction happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, th was it 3.7 billion, yeah, billion dollars? 3.7 Yeah, congrats, and uh, I guess yeah. no big deal uh, for you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, yeah. um, you know, I definitely want to be able to let the audience hear a little bit about your next chapter. So sure. January is closed. <laughs> why did you, I think you have your, you have a few things going on mm -hmm. here, but why, why did you decide to not take a break? You know, I did take a break, you know, I actually after, I, so I didn't join Cisco uh, when Cisco bought up Dynamics, and I was, uh, it was a it was a important question on what to do next in life, right? Yeah. And I had the, the the range was like do nothing, just retire on a beach, do like you know be in a lot of boards and not in any kind of operating role, or like do something else again, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's not an easy question, uh, you know. I actually the first thing I did was let's try retiring on the beach or travel around it. <laughs> and so my wife and I we did that for some time. And after six months we got really bored of uh, <laughs> like we can't sit on the beach anymore. <laughs> so let's uh, so we gotta do something. And that's when, like, you know, I realized, like, you know, I like to operate. You know, this was to me, it's like building the company was. It wasn't just about money. It was about like I, I enjoyed every day of it. I enjoyed the challenges of it. I challenge. I enjoyed the, you know, it's like the the building the teams, competing the market, figuring out hard problems, learning a lot. Like learning from, you know, becoming from engineer to sales to marketing to like different kind of financial strategy to people leadership culture, all those things. Right? It was just fun. So I was, Sounds like, you I like, was like, let me just do that again. Yeah, do you, you love the game. I love the game. So it's that's so I was like, I, I have to do it. But one thing I did was I started uh, something called a startup studio, where I could experiment with multiple problem areas. It's called Big Labs, and then you know the problem areas that start looking very exciting and interesting, then we spin them out into a separate company. And the goal is like to spin out maybe one company every two to three years, not like one dozens of companies kind of thing, right? So. Uh, so I, we spent out our first company, Harness, which I'm uh, co-founder and CEO right now, and it's a it's it's a, it's a Series A stage startup. So it's like it's it's early. It's like we are finding we are in that phase of we have our first 15 customers now. So we kind of found our early product market fit, and we are figuring out you know what to do from there next. So it's exciting to go through that again, and it, it's great. And then I have I have another new, new thing which actually was just announced yesterday, which is the seed stage venture fund. And uh, I partnered with, uh, with uh, this person, John Virionis, who was a, a very, very uh, seasoned investor. He was a very seasoned investor. He was the first investor in AppDynamics when he was at Lightspeed. And so, it, uh, and you know, one of the great investors that I know. And we, we were very passionate about, like, you know, this, that the zero to $1 million stage, you know, this conference is about one to $100 million, that, that a lot of people are not getting, the founders are not getting help that they need in the zero to $1 million because of how venture industry has shifted, that a lot of focus is, you know, kind of the, in the, the later stages. So we started this fund where, you know, we can help, uh, we can help people go into a more systematic way from the zero to $1 million. Great. So that's, uh, that's, that's our new fund called Unusual Ventures. Well, Jyoti, thanks so much for walking us through AppDynamics and also your three ventures ahead. <laughs> We're looking forward to your fourth job. Sure. Uh, and uh, everyone, please give a hand to Jyoti.